Good day from Banjo Dunk Production Studio in Toronto, Canada. An audiobook podcast based on my book, My Good Times with Stomp and Tom. I'm your host, Duncan Fremlin from the band Whiskey Jack. Chapter 7 Tom's Policy in the Studio. Tom's longtime friend and musical companion, Mickey Andrews, has probably spent more time in a recording studio with Tom than anyone. I don't know if Mickey received credit on the album jackets, not likely, but from what he tells me, on many of the old recordings from the 1960s, he did a lot of the work a producer would do. In those days, Tom would begin by recording the guitar, vocal, and the boot. Mickey would then record his steel guitar part, or perhaps some dobro and drums. Tom credited himself as a producer, but he relied on others to figure out how to complete the recording. Many of the final cuts were recorded live in one take. He liked that approach. Tom's mentor, Wilf Carter, he recorded this way also. Later in his career, his approach to recording didn't really change, at least according to his longtime engineer, Brian Hewson, owner of Escarpment Sound outside Toronto. Brian began working with Tom in 1986. Says Brian, there was no pre-production or fancy arrangements when we arrived to record a record. We'd work on one song at a time, each track recorded live off the floor. Tom would stand in the studio, guitar in hand, and sing the song for the band, whoever that might be. There would usually be a bass player and maybe one other guitarist. Sometimes there'd be a drummer, Tom would teach the band the song. They'd run through it two or three times. If the timing was a bit off, he wouldn't be bothered by that much. One time, when I was in a sound booth recording some banjo overdubs for the Believe in Your Country album, I remember overhearing Tom tell Brian and anyone else in the control room that the fans don't want it too fancy. The final take was rarely perfect, and that suited Tom just fine. It certainly suited his level of proficiency on the guitar. He never thought of himself as a virtuoso, so it would have been very difficult for him to nail down a perfect guitar track. I was in the studio for most of the Dr. Stomp and Tom A recording sessions. This was a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I wanted to witness as much of it as I could. Tom may not have made all of the engineering decisions, but there was never any doubt who was in charge. Once the basic track and his voice were recorded to his satisfaction, he'd begin to call in other instruments to be added to the track. Banjo, accordion, harmonica, always fiddle, sometimes dobro, steel guitar, and so on. In 1993, during the Stomp and Tom recording session, when Whiskey Jack was finished with their parts, Tom began to look for a harmonica player and an accordion player. I suggested he call Toronto session player Chris Whiteley. Whiskey Jack had worked with Chris often over the years, and I thought Tom would like him. I told Tom he was pretty good at other instruments like the steel guitar and the trumpet. For the rest of Tom's recording career, he used Chris often. I also suggested he call accordion virtuoso Dennis Caldy in Toronto, and that was also a relationship that continued for many recordings. According to Brian, once Tom had all the tracks he needed, we'd listen to all of them and then begin the mix by eliminating entire tracks or parts of tracks. The level of his voice was the most important track. It was important to him that the listener could hear every word. My first time in the studio with Tom was on the Believe in Your Country album in 1991. I remember him sitting in the control booth and orchestrating the banjo track by giving me vague directions. He talked to me about what he wanted. He simply had a hard time describing it. The five-string banjo, when played in the three-finger style, generally plays eight notes per bar. That wasn't what Tom was hearing in his head. On the title cut, I played through the track a few times, offering him some variations of the eight notes to the bar. None were what he was looking for. He finally told me, Play fewer notes. 
That's it, he finally exclaimed, much to the surprise of the engineer and the rest of us in the studio. I remembered this and would offer it to him in future sessions. Later, when I listened to some of the old discs that he recorded in the 1960s and 1970s, I'd hear that exact banjo style in some of the songs. Around 1985, in the middle of Tom's hiatus from the music business, he returned to the recording studio. His plan was to record five Canadian performers and release an album under his new label, Act Records. The recording was called Stompin' Tom is Back to ACT, Assist Canadian Talent. As it turns out, 30 years later, when Whiskey Jack recorded their own CD of Stompin' Tom material, Stories and Songs of Stompin' Tom, we used the same engineer, Dave Ferry, and the same studio, Orchard Sound. We had lots of time during the sessions to hear Dave's Stompin' Tom stories of this project. As my pal and editor of this book, Jim Bain, has said many times, everyone has a Stompin' Tom story. Writes Dave, Tom was never without a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. He used a cigarette holder, which meant the cigarette was a good foot or so out in front of his face, and when he talked, yelled, or even screamed, that cigarette holder was clenched between his front teeth and the cigarette would bob up and down like a torch, scattering sparks and ashes everywhere. My partner, Wendell Ferguson, would spend most of his time in the session walking around behind Tom with a mini dustbuster, vacuuming up the sparks and ashes trying to avoid the studio going up in flames. The days were long and very confusing. If you can imagine Tom and his band and entourage alone, that would be enough people crammed into the studio. But in this situation, Tom had five other artists with him. So there were the five artists, their wives, husbands, kids, dogs, mothers-in-law, fathers-in-law, and any other relative who wanted to come to the studio to watch the legendary Stomp and Tom Connors perform in the studio. My wackiest memory of the session was when we got to the mixing. I begged him, take a day off, clear our heads, and get to mixing after we've had a bit of a rest. Tom wouldn't hear of it. As the last members of the band walked out of the studio, Tom had me setting up the board to start mixing. So away we go, mixing. I started bringing up the instruments one at a time and analyzing each one, trying to get a nice mix going. Tom immediately put out his hand and said, whoa, 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 what are we listening to this on? I pointed to the JBL speakers I had mounted in the wall. They had big 15-inch drivers with a big horn. Tom looked at me and said, I don't know anybody that has speakers like that. So I thought, fair enough. I hit my speaker switch and knocked the audio down to a smaller pair of Yamaha NS10Ms, a very common studio speaker system in those days. Everyone used NS10Ms. Once again, Tom looked at me and said, now what are we listening to? I pointed to the Yamahas and said, those nice little bookshelf speakers. Tom looked at me and said, I don't know anybody that has a pair of speakers like that. He was starting to get a little perturbed. The cigarette and holder were starting to flail. Then he looked at me and said, I want to know what this is going to sound like to a guy out on his boat. Now get me something that a guy would have on his boat. I kind of fell off my chair and thought, what the hell am I going to do now? Then I remembered in our junk closet, buried way in the back, for some reason I had this little GE electric clock radio with a single speaker about three inches in size. I retrieved it from the closet and proceeded to wire it up mono, and we laid it on the console, and that is what we listened to 90% of the time to mix the entire record. Tom smiled and would listen to nothing else. Although I didn't entirely disagree with the concept, it did kind of drive me crazy. Thanks to the beer that was consumed nonstop during the sessions, Tom would have to get up out of his chair every so often to hit the bathroom. That would give me a few minutes to click the audio back up to some bigger speakers and hear what was really going on. But before Tom would return, 
I would have to make sure we were back on the GE radio. And when he would return, you could bet he had a fresh beer from the mountain of beer cases stacked in the lobby, floor to ceiling. We called it the Leaning Tower of 50. I've heard Tom speak often about his approach to recording his songs, and Dave's story pretty much describes the recording philosophy of all of the old country singers. Wilf Carter spoke of his recording style in an interview one time, and it was identical to Tom's. Nothing sophisticated, keep it simple, and hope the feeling of the song is evident in the final mix. One of the most experienced session players that Tom used on a few of his recordings was less than polite when he wrote. The recording process that he used, one that I witnessed on a few occasions, was in my view inappropriate for what he was trying to do, and the end product was amateurish. For his music, and this was evident in his earlier recordings, the recordings and his interpretations of his songs would have been more genuine and authentic if it had been recorded live off the floor. He thought of himself as a producer, so he wouldn't do it any other way. But the studio story I love the best comes from the Dave Ferry sessions in 1985. This really sets Tom apart. As Dave tells it, Tom would have been happier with a two-track recording studio from the 1920s, not one of those modern 16 or 24 track systems. All in all, said Dave, the session went as well as could be expected, given the confusion and just generally being frazzled for six or seven days straight. It was an honor for me to work closely with a Canadian legend. I'm pretty sure Tom was happy too. As about two or three months after the ACT session, Tom called me up again and said, I'd like to come back to the orchard to do another album. I was thrilled, but then came the knockout punch. At that time, Orchard Studio was a 16-track studio. Tom said to me, I'm only going to use eight tracks for my next record, so I want to get the studio for half price. I said, Tom, I can't do that. You're still using all the gear, the same amount of heat and hydro. The machine is still running. I just can't work up here for $12.50 an hour. Tom would hear none of it. Down the road, Tom and Dave would meet again. Many years later, says Dave, my wife and I went into a small pub called the Georgian Dragon. As we made our way to a table, I looked up at the bar, and there it was, the big black cowboy hat, and seated underneath the hat was, you know who. I said, holy shit, I gotta go say hi to Tom. I walked up to him, put my hand on his shoulder. He turned and looked at me and said, Dave Ferry. Holy Christ, did you ever get fat? I looked him straight in the eye and said, Tom Connors, holy Christ, did you ever get old? The corner of his lip curled up as he smiled, and he clinked my glass with his beer and said, Touché. That's why I love the guy. <laughs> 